I want to welcome everyone to a live webinar sponsored jointly by the Whale Sanctuary Project and the Camilla Center for Animal Advocacy. I am Lori Marino, and I am the president of the Whale Sanctuary Project and executive director of the Camilla Center. And it's been my great honor uh, to work with the Non-Human Rights Project over the past several years on the science behind the legal effort to have basic rights recognized for non-human beings. Cetaceans, great apes, and elephants all possess autonomy, which is a classic hallmark of personhood. Yet the effort to recognize personhood for non-human animals continues to be an uphill struggle in the legal courts. Um, this has to do with the fact that we all have to overcome inherent biases in our human views of other species. These biases exist um, in everyone, including judges, lawyers, all of us. And yet judges are really in the position of weighing and deciding upon the scientific evidence um, and the philosophical and legal arguments put forth on behalf of other animals by the non-human rights projects and other efforts. Therefore, the Non-Human Rights Project has the unenviable task of not only delivering cogent arguments about the cognitive characteristics of other animals, but overcoming these inherent co uh, confirmation biases in our society, including the giggle factor, which uh, prevents us from taking the rights of other animals seriously. In this live webinar, we and I will introduce my, my guest momentarily. In this live webinar, we discuss these issues from a scientific, philosophical, and legal perspective, focusing on the way courtroom judges reflect our society's biases against other animals. We give examples of what judges and others have said about non-human personhood that reveal our mindset about other animals and the challenges we face in recognizing their rights. And we also give examples of judges getting it right as well. Um, finally, we discuss ways we can overcome these challenges to attain legal rights for animal clients. So I now want to welcome my, my two guests uh, to this panel. The first is Robert Jones, and he is an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Dominguez Hills. And uh, he holds a PhD in philosophy from Stanford and works on questions at the intersection of applied ethics, animal cognition, speciesism, and social justice within an animal liberation and activism framework. He's published numerous articles and book chapters on animal ethics and is a contributing author to Chimpanzee Rights, The Philosopher's Brief, 2018. He is also working on a book on political anti-speciesism and animal oppression. And uh, he is a first-generation college student who hails from Philadelphia. So welcome, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. And my next guest is Kevin Schneider, who's the executive director of the Non-Human Rights Project. He earned his law degree from Florida State in 2013 with a specialization in environmental and land use law and graduated with a BA in political science from U UMass Boston in, in 2009. He's been a member of the New York Bar since 2014. And Kevin started really as a volunteer with the NHRP uh, in 2010 and he became director five years later. In addition to his interest in non-human rights and personhood, Kevin is an advocate for reforming the food system with a focus on plant-based foods. So welcome, Kevin. Welcome, Robert. We appreciate having you here. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Robert uh, to start things off with, with our discussion of uh, philosophy behind uh, the Non-Human Rights Project and personhood. Thanks, Lori, and thanks, uh, Kevin, for coming together to do this. I'm very excited to 
uh, do this presentation with the two of you today. I feel honored. Um, thanks to, for, to everyone who's atten in, uh, in attendance. So um, I'm going to share my screen in a moment because I do have a presentation just to give you a little uh, kind of heads up. I'm going to talk about the sort of the philosophy behind the project, and then I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Lori Marino, and she's going to get into the nitty gritty of the uh, the psychological and physiological aspects of, of, of the animal cognition. And then Kevin's gonna uh, come in at the end and talk about the legal details of the case. So that's sort of the plan. So let me sh first share my screen. All right, so uh, let me start out, give you a little background on what this case is actually about, okay? So it starts with Stephen Wise, who is the founder and president of the Non-Human Rights Project. And uh, Stephen's been doing this for, I think, 25 years. Uh, and he's basically been focus on, focusing on trying to get um, uh, personhood uh, acknowledged but for non-human animals by the court system in the, in the US. Now, um, there are many paths up the mountain to you know, animal liberation, animal rights. There's many types of activism and many beliefs. And you know, I don't think that Sometimes people say, is that really the way to get animal liberation? Well, there's, you know, this is one, one route that Stephen has been relentlessly um, uh, on, on the path of. So, um, so that's, that's basically what he's dedicated his life to. And in 2016, a, a film was made, a documentary called Unlocking the Cage. The last time I checked, it was on Netflix. It's a really, it's a great documentary. And uh, that documentary, the reason I mentioned it, I'll mention it once again, is because the connection between how I got involved and, and how, how, how the philosopher's brief came about has to do with this connection. So first of all, let me tell you a little bit about the, uh, the clients that uh, Stephen is representing in this particular case. First, we have Kiko, who was a chimpanzee who was used in movies, Tarzan in Manhattan. You know, I don't know. I honestly have never seen it, never probably want to see it. Um, but here's Kiko today. Kiko is in upstate New York and he's kept chained in a storefront right there. So Kiko, the chimpanzee, spent his life in film and then was retired, quote, retired to this facility. Tommy is the other chimpanzee that we were um, writing in, on behalf of. Tommy was also in, in the film, he, I mean, he was in films, but you may have seen this film, Project X. It was big in the eighties. And here's Tommy now, Tommy lives in a cage off the side of the road, I think it's in upstate New York as well. This is Tommy's life. So Tommy and Kiko have been taken from uh, the film industry and then put into these cages. So they've never really had a life, known a life where they had have had freedom in, in the jungles and their natural habitats. So the Non-Human Rights Project strategy is the following, to petition the New York State Court of Appeals for a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of Tommy and Kiko. This writ, and, and Kevin will talk more about this, the, the great writ as it's sometimes called. It basically, when you, when, you, uh, when you petition for a writ of habeas corpus, you're saying that there, a person is being detained or confined or restrained unlawfully. Now there's legal precedent for this strategy. It goes back to the 18th century in the case Somerset versus Stewart in which an enslaved African American, James Somerset was in, it was taken over to England, he escaped and then was captured and uh, the case went before the British common law courts and a writ of habeas corpus was uh, granted to, to James Somerset, acknowledging him as a person. And this was a legal milestone in the abolition of human slavery, at least in the African slave trade. So there's, there's precedent for this strategy. All right, so let me give you the court's view. The court, according to the court in, in the United States, every entity is classified as either a person or thing. Those are the exhaustive, that exhausts the categories, person or thing. The way they reason is like this. Only, person have right, only persons have rights that confinement violates. So to have a right to habeas corpus, you have to be a person, right? But Tommy and Kiko are considered things, not persons. So the court denies a habeas corpus writ to Tommy and Kiko. So basically the petition is to say, look, what non-human rights uh, strategy is, look, if, if according to the court system, 
if every entity is either categorized as a person or a thing, here's one thing that's obvious. Tommy and Kiko are not, uh, they're not things, right? I mean, so if those are the only two categories, they have to be persons. So that's sort of the, the court's view and that strategy. Now, let me just give you a little quick primer on the difference between person and human being. Because when I talk about this stuff, whenever we talk about non-human personhood, in the, in the vernacular you know, of, the, of our culture, person is just synonymous with human being. And so for many of us, the, the very notion of non-human personhood could be con can be confusing until we understand that these are specific terms of art, both in philosophy and in the legal setting. So a human being is basically a member of the species Homo sapien, right? So it's, it's a biological feature. That's what it is to be human. The difference here is that person or personhood is not a biological feature. It's a normative, or in this case, a legal feature of a being, one that confers moral and legal standing. So hopefully this clarifies how in the world could you have a non-human person? Well, once you understand that person or personhood is not a function of biology and instead a function of, of uh, normative um, or legal uh, uh, conferring of, of standing, then you can see how it's possible. Okay, let's come back to the film, which I highly recommend. So Stephen was going around at college campuses showing the film and two of my friends here, Letitia and Andrew at uh, Dalhousie in Nova Scotia, they were at a screening, at least this is the story as, as I recall it. And after the screening, there was a Q&A with Stephen. And then they approached Stephen and said, I think that animal rights philosophers can help you clarify some of these ideas. We can help with the case. And so thanks to Letitia and Andrew, a team of philosophers uh, were called together. We do animal rights. And we basically went through the rulings, the various uh, appellate rulings of the Supreme uh, Court and State Court in New York, and we produced an amicus brief. And here is everyone, 17 philosophers. Now, I mean, when I think about it, it's pretty amazing to have a case arguing for personhood rights. But what's even more amazing is that you can get 17 philosophers to agree, agree about anything. So that's a pretty amazing thing. But we did get 17 people to commit to come together and write the philosopher's brief, which was submitted as an amicus, amicus brief on behalf of the Not Human Rights Project, on behalf of Tommy and Kiko. There were many other amicus briefs like Jane Goodall and I think Larry Tribe from Harvard. And then we turned it into a book. It came out in 2018, The Philosopher's Brief. So you can read that. Highly recommend it. It's a page turner. Um, okay, so what's the, what's, how's this work? So here's what we did. We, we went through with the help of the team, the legal team, and with the, all of us reading through it, we noticed that there are three distinct notions of person that have, are implied, uh, employed by the, uh, by the court, right? So sometimes when they're talking about person, they're talking about species membership. And then other times when they're talking about person, they're talking about person um, in relation to social contract. And other times they're talking about person as being a member of a community of persons or this community membership. So. What we basically did, and again, this is a really brief encapsulation of what, you know the, all the all the arguments that we that we uh, presented. But um, briefly, the, we what we did is we took each concept or each notion of personhood that the court employed, and we basically really went through and analyzed it and came to the conclusion that if you really push these, either Tommy and Kiko should be persons under one of these three notions, or there are human persons who don't qualify, right? So, so that's part of the reason why this event is called Judges Say the Darndest Things, because there was a lot of tension, dare I say, inconsistency among the rulings. And so, as you know, you can imagine, philosophers get really upset about inconsistencies. So, um, so let, I want to go through each one quickly and talk about how the court thought about these views and then what we had to say in response. So first, the species membership view. So the court said, look, habeas corpus relief has only been granted to members of the species Homo sapiens, right? There's a precedent for this. <clears throat> Under the law, all and only members of the human species are recognized as persons. And that there's a, there's a strong intuitive pull to that. Yeah, persons are humans and that's the way the law's always been, right? 
Of course, that's not always a good argument. So here are some objections we raised. First of all, personhood is not a biological concept, but species membership is a biological concept. So there's a mismatch there to rely on species membership solely to dictate what a person is, is to ignore that it's not a biological concept. You can't meaningfully derive personhood from the category, you know, homo sapiens. Here's an example, okay? Um, and the other thing is that membership in the species homo, homo sapien cannot be necessary for personhood. So let me give you some, one, one, a couple of you know, sci-fi kind of examples, but you know, they, they, they make the point. So let's take two different species of hominids. You have homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Now suppose that Neanderthals had survived into the current era. There would be another living hominid species. It's still an open question whether or not they would be persons or whether or not they would have human rights. And even there's a recent discovery that Neanderthals interbred with modern homo sapiens in Europe. So scientists might redefine these two species into one, but again, it would still be an open question as to who is a person. In other words, there are no biological, natural fa biological facts alone that could ever decide the question of personhood. To make it even more clear, a science fiction case helps. Here's um, one of my favorite shows, Star Trek, and there's a character named Worf who's a Klingon. Now, Worf is certainly a person. He's not a human being, but it would be, it, it would be totally wrong, obviously, to say, no, you're not a homo sapien, so therefore you can be chained up and put in a cage. No. So clearly, Worf would have uh, habeas corpus rights where he is a citizen, but, um, but he's not human. Okay, so the species membership account makes an error of equating humanness with personhood. So upon hearing these kinds of arguments, the court said, no, 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 actually it's not, it's not really, it's the species membership, it's actually this notion of a contract, right? When you, when you say that animals have rights, connected to rights is this notion of obligations and duties, right? Some principles that even uh, suggest a tacit kind of contract, social contract theory, right? Chimpanzees cannot bear any legal duties, submit to societal responsibilities, or be held legally accountable for their actions. So now they're saying they're not persons, so there's no writ of habeas corpus because chimpanzees cannot bear legal duties or responsibilities. Well, hopefully you can see there's some problems with that view. Namely, on that view, some human beings are not persons, right? Infants, children, some persons with severe cognitive disabilities cannot bear, bear duties and responsibilities, but they're still persons, right? So social contract theory does not rule out the personhood of Tommy and Kiko. So then the court says, no, no, well, actually, the reason why they're persons is because they're members of the human community, right? That's what makes you a person. You, you, the thing that confers these kinds of rights on you is because you are a member of the human community. So it's true, the court says, infants and children cannot bear duties, but they are still persons because they are members of the human community. Okay, so then if you think about it, you go, well, what does it mean to be a, quote, member of the human community? What does that really mean when you try to distill it? Well, it could be that you're just, you know, being human as a, makes you a member of the human community, or it could mean this sort of grander idea that you we are embedded in these kinds of interpersonal webs of interdependence and communication and trust. And so, so to be in a community doesn't really need, mean being human necessarily. If it does, if the court means being human, well, then we're just back to the species membership account. And we already saw that there are problems with that. So they can't mean that. So they must mean that being a member of the human community means in being embedded in, in certain ways with humans. But if that's the case, and that explains how vulnerable humans are persons, that also includes Tommy and Kiko, because as you've seen, Tommy and Kiko, their whole lives, they've been, been embedded in the human community. They started out in film and now they're in a cage, right? So that's the negative argument. Let me end with what the positive argument is. And the positive argument, if, uh, according to the uh, Non-Human Rights Project and what we argue in the book is that autonomy is what is sufficient for personhood. And you might say, why autonomy? Well, it's a capacity that philosophers have historically associated with personhood, going back to John Locke or Immanuel Kant. 
violating someone's autonomy is widely regarded as a harm, right? Un unlawful detention and put an isolation in a concrete cell. This is a, a, a kind of paradigm case of a violation of someone's autonomy. So you should have a writ of habeas corpus if your autonomy is being violated in that way. What do we mean by autonomy? Well, this is a big topic, but let me just throw a few things out there. The first thing is a being that's intentional. In other words, a being whose actions require things like thinking and plans, representations of events to, to reach a certain kind of end or goal. Do chimpanzees act intentionally? I think that Dr. Marino is going to answer that question. Adequately formed understanding, right? So beings who have the, uh, the competence to comprehend cause and effect, what their actions, uh, what the consequences of their actions and decision making. Do chimpanzees understand the world around them in that way? Do chimpanzees make knowledge-based decisions? I think we're gonna find out the answer to that is yes. So these capacities of autonomy, they confer kinds of interests which are then violated by confinement. Thus, the court to be consistent should grant writ of habeas corpus to Tommy and Kiko. So here's the argument in a nutshell. Autonomy is sufficient for personhood. Tommy and Kiko are autonomous beings and therefore Tommy and Kiko are persons. So now to speak about the, the, the main, this main premise here, number two, that Tommy and Kiko are autonomous, let me turn it over to Dr. Marino and, and uh, she can pick it up there, thanks. Thank you very, very much, Robert. So I wanna talk about the science behind the Non-Human Rights Project because that's where I've been, I've been uh, what the area I've been working in and how I came to be involved with the Non-Human Rights Project. Um, and we've been talking about Tommy and Kiko, uh, two chimpanzees, but um, everything I'm gonna say also relates to cetaceans, dolphins and whales, as well as elephants. So as Robert says, a being with autonomy is a unique individual who has desires, plans, intentionality, a sense of self. And autonomy is relevant for most judges for basic liberty rights in human context. So the question is, what is the evidence for autonomy in great apes, cetaceans, and elephants? So first, sense of self. Sense of self is key and central to autonomy, to personhood. And we know from the peer reviewed scientific data that great apes, elephants, and dolphins have a sense of self because they recognize themselves in mirrors. They can imitate, that is, copy someone else's actions which means that they have a sense of their own body and how it relates to the body of someone else. And they possess metacognition, the ability to think about their own thoughts. Now, dolphins and chimpanzees uh, have been tested in this arena. Elephants have not yet, uh, but I'm hoping someone will do that study. But uh, what we see is that these three groups of these three taxa uh, are, are comprise individuals who are able to, to, re to recognize themselves and have a sense of self. Now, what is the importance of self-recognition? Um, I want to spend just a, a short amount of time on this. Animals who recognize themselves in mirrors know that it is them. So if you are a dolphin, or a chimpanzee or an elephant, you look in the mirror and you use the mirror to groom your own body, then in a sense, what you're saying is, hey, that's me, that's me in the mirror. And what that means is that what you're bringing to the situation is a sense of self. You don't say, hey, that's me, if you don't have a sense of me. But what that also means is that you are aware that you're in a tank as well. Um, this is what I thought of when Diana Reese and I published our definitive evidence of mirror self-recognition in bottlenose dolphins held at the New York Aquarium. Um, if you can say, that's me in the mirror, you can also think about, yeah, this is me in the barren tank. 
And so self-awareness is important because it gives you the ability to be aware not only of yourself, but your situation. Now, um, another aspect of autonomy is intentionality and great apes, elephants and dolphins also uh, display this capacity. They understand mental states in others. They empathize with others. They attribute intentions to others. For instance, in the case of understanding pointing, as you see here in all three panels, and they understand causation. Now, pointing is important because it means that you understand someone is referring to something else. And finally, one, if not, you know, one of the other capacities that come into play here is foreplanning. And here again, great apes, elephants, and dolphins exhibit this capacity. They delay gratification and mentally time travel. In other words, they can think about and plan for the future. They plan sequences of actions towards a future goal. And we know from our day-to-day -day life how important this is in our sense of self, in our autonomy, because it, we, it gives us an autobiographical timeline and allows us to think about our life in the past, in the present, and in the future. And the science tells us that chimpanzees, other great apes, dolphins, and elephants all have these same capacities. Now, I want to turn to a word of caution about some of our inherent biases. Take a look at this uh, cartoon. There's some different non-human beings lined up, and the, uh, the guy says, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. And so I think we all see what the joke is here. So just the point is that despite the fact that there are robust data to show that these other animals share capacities with humans that we consider definitional for autonomy, we need to keep in mind that our science is a little like this cartoon. We ask other animals to do what we do well. None of these findings that I've just summarized for you on floor planning and mirror self-recognition and et cetera, indicate that cetaceans, elephants, or great apes possess lesser versions of these capacities. And in fact, one can argue that given how anthropocentric we are and how anthropocentric our science is, that they perform rather impressively. But we hold our species up as the gold standard. Why do we do this? Well, ever since Aristotle and probably before, we've had a worldview that places humans on top of a ladder of progress or value. It's called the scala natura, a natural scale. And all other animals have a fixed place below it. Now, during medieval times, this idea was co-opted by the Catholic Church and they added angels and God above humans. And then in the post-Darwinian time, even after Darwin, uh, we still refer to this idea as a scale, a phylogenetic scale. The two implicit assumptions of this are that one, humans are superior to other animals, and Two, that humans are somehow qualitatively different from other animals because we are part animal and part spiritual. Um, of course, none of this is true, but it's a bias that is around even today. And we should remember that this scheme is something we still come up against when we argue for uh, non-human rights. But now, even now, the notion of scala natura is found in textbooks, scientific articles, and so forth. Such terms or phrases as lower versus higher, advanced versus primitive, the ascent of man, humans evolved from chimpanzees, and even the phrase humans and animals are all incorrect. Um, there's no scala natura. And in fact, there's only a branching 
pattern of speciation that looks more like a tree that I'm showing you here. Humans are not on top of anything. They are at the tip of one small branch firmly embedded in the great ape clade. So this is important to remember when we are thinking about capacities in other animals. And now I wanna to turn to Kevin Schneider to tell you about the non-human rights project lawsuits. Okay, thank you, Lori. Welcome. So you might think after hearing those two very smart people that this would be a slam dunk for us. But I'm gonna tell you why, um, as a lawyer, when you bring these claims into court, try to tie together the science, philosophy, ethics, history, and we think it makes a very compelling case. That's why Steve and myself and many others have really dedicated our careers and lives to this. So you, again, you'd think it would be a slam dunk, but it turns out that judges are human too. Um, they carry biases implicitly, uh, explicitly, um, just like all of us do. And you'll see in the opinions that I'll talk about here, mostly focusing on our cases from 2014 to 2020, uh, you can see that um, while they do have these biases, we, and it can be difficult to try to overcome them, uh, we've seen already pretty significant progress and that's just here in the US. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the, at the end about some very encouraging notes about how judges in other countries are really taking the lead on this issue, not just in the context of uh, non-human animals and their specific right to habeas corpus, personhood for other reasons, legal rights, but also applying these ideas to parts of the natural world. So rivers and mountains and streams, the idea that um, is now very much a reality that they are also legal persons. As I've said in other contexts, I've kind of how I like to explain to people, you know, Amazon, the corporation, as, as useful as it is, especially these days, um, is a person. And so why shouldn't the original Amazon, the rainforest, which provides untold magnitude more value to humans, even if you're gonna be so selfish and only think about human kind of gain from it, is vastly more valuable and yet is by and large a thing. I mean, you can even, last time I checked on Facebook, you can buy parts of it in some countries. So um, that's a lot to say that, you know, it's complicated when you try to actually change policy and really, I think people oftentimes scratch their heads and say, you know, you learn about the horrific things that happen to animals of all kinds, shapes and sizes. And you say, you know, how, how in a logical, rational, you know, justice, abiding society, how can we let this go? And it turns out that, you know, <laughs> the animal issue itself is very big. So that's one thing. Um, and so that's why the science and talking about specific individuals and specific species, we find from our perspective at the Non-Human Rights Project uh, to be very important. And I think has been our big part of our ability to get begin getting through to judges. Um, but again, like Lori just touched on, and uh, Robert touched on, you have these ingrained notions, especially Scala Natura, but what that really translates to for us is this idea of human exceptionalism. And you'll see in some of the opinions that we talk about how, um, how this plays out. And one, one thing I also like to say in this context, we're talking about bias, but also you know how things can change. When Steve started out uh, about uh, you know in the 80s and 70s even, uh, beginning to take on back in the days, it was one of the first cases that were that were fought over were um, having to do with the euthanization of dogs. So your dog bites somebody um, or another dog gets into a fight and then um, a court says that the dog has to be put down. So Steve was among the first lawyers in this country to challenge those orders. And when he would walk into court, other lawyers would bark at him you know, they would hiss that they would, you know, it would, it was an open joke. And I think it's fair to say that in this day and age, that is very much not the case anymore. Um, even in parts of the country where you think it might still be the case, it's not the case. And um, so there has been an evolution in, in not just, you know, how judges think about this and react to it, but also how the broader society does. So I think that's a positive thing. Um, but nonetheless, um, we're here to talk about some of the damnedest things that 
that uh, judges say. So um, I wanted to start with, this is not something from our cases, but this is a quote from Christopher Stone, a law professor's book from uh, the early 70s, Should Trees Have Standing? Um, for any lawyers in the crowd, you might know this because it was quite famously cited in a case, Supreme Court case called uh, Sierra Club versus Morton. It was a very early environmental law case in the 70s. And he said each time there's a movement to confer rights onto some new entity, that's an important word there, entity, um, being or a mountain or a corporation or a human being, you know, like, like Robert touched on, when it comes to the word person in the law, we don't care about your biology, we don't care if you breathe. That's really, for most uh, instances, besides the point. So he says, you know, anytime you're trying to confer rights onto some entity that never has had them before, like a chimpanzee or an elephant, uh, or, you know, in other cases, the proposal is bound to sound odd or frightening or laughable. Uh, and this is partly because until the rightless thing receives its rights, we cannot see, as any, see it as anything but a thing for the use of us, those of us who are holding rights at the time, in other words, persons. Now, um, we can take it for granted for the most part, uh, fortunately today, that every human being is a person. That is the right thing. You know, uh, I, you know, I think anyone who would argue against that is obviously that's terrible. And regardless of your sentience, regardless of your autonomy, if you're a human being, whatever that might mean, you know, Robert pointed out, there's all kinds of holes with that, but that's not what we take issue with, right? Every person, every human being should be a person and have fundamental rights and the capacity for fundamental rights, because at the end of the day, all that um, we say this even to judges and other lawyers, because, you know, this is something you take for granted. You don't really think about this in law school or even have to think about it. What is a person? But we often say a person is really just like a cup. Um, it doesn't, doesn't matter what your biology is. You Again, you can be a, a river or a corporation. The idea is that you are uh, like a container for rights. So there, there's actually like some sort of entity that the law recognizes as being able to possess rights. So that's really all that a, a person is. And a thing, of course, the other side of the dyad is um, any entity that lacks the capacity for rights. Um, and so that's oversimplifying a bit, but that's, that's what uh, we're talking about. So throughout history, just restricting it to the US, but you can look elsewhere too. Um, judges have in their rulings occasionally written passages which you know, may have passed for polite opinion at the time, but are now seen as so obviously odious and unimaginable and, and terrible. You know, we tear statues down of, of people who wrote these things. So you have, of course, the, the um, Dred Scott opinion where the Supreme Court stated that all black people, slave and free, had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. This was in 1857. And um, you see below in the California Supreme Court in 1854, right around the same time, held that Chinese people could not testify against white men in court because the court held that Chinese people indulge in open violation of law, whose mendacity is proverbial, a race of people whom nature is marked as inferior. It goes on, right? But you can see that obviously this was the product of a bad time and a bad way of thinking and something we can now look back on and say uniformly, that's terrible. But the thing is, you know, if you're watching social change from, you know, hundreds of years out, zoomed out, it can look fairly smooth. But when you're actually doing it day to day and you can read the, um, you know, past, like we have studied things like the Somerset case, but many other cases too, the fundamental idea that you're trying to expand rights to an individual or group that has not had them up until that time. There's a lot of kind of recurring themes and biases and sort of knee-jerk reactions that you tend to see from judges. So I think it's it's almost like maybe a human nature. It's kind of built into us kind of thing. Um, but now to look at more specifically our cases, the Non-Human Rights Project, which we started filing just about in 2014, at the very end of 2013, and the question we pose, as we've discussed, is can a non-human animal, whom science has shown to be autonomous, in this case, a chimpanzee or elephant, have a right to bodily liberty and be a, quote, person for habeas corpus? Um, and the courts that we've been in front of in what is, you know, six years in the law is really not, it's kind of a blink of the eye, even though it is, you can feel like quite a long time. Uh, they've reached pretty wildly different conclusions, which might seem like a negative thing, but actually I think it's quite a, Broad, and broadly speaking, a positive thing, because we can see 
um, fairly clearly, at least in New York, an evolution towards um, actually coming around to our view. So you have Tommy, who um, Robert introduced, captive chimpanzee, who we now actually believe is in Michigan. It's a nightmare trying to, because again, he's someone's property. Tommy's a thing. So you think he's an endangered species. You know, we have all these welfare laws. You should be able to call someone up and find out where he is. Good luck. I mean, it is really hard to find a great ape. And it's as crazy as that sounds, it's it's the legal equivalent of like demanding to see where someone's TV is. Now, even though we represented him in court, you know, we don't have, he's still a thing. And so we, um, it's been a it's been a real struggle to try to continue to advocate for him when we can't even necessarily tell where he is or sadly if he's still alive. Um, but uh, then we also have Kiko who is still alive. We know or believe so just from Facebook posts. The guy who owns him, um, you know, posts about him on Facebook. Um, and then Hercules and Leo, who famously were the first um, non-human animals to be the subject of an actual court hearing, at least a common law. In habeas petition hearing in this country, um, actually debating the question of their freedom. And they were used in research and there. The uh, whole trial is covered. And I echo strongly what Robert said about watching Unlocking the Cage, because their whole trial is covered there. And then we uh, go to Connecticut. We have Beulah, Minnie, and Karen, who are three elephants in a traveling um, circus, really, in Connecticut. Sadly, two of them have died. Minnie is the sole um, survivor. And um, we'll talk about how that's crazy that the courts have really just basically closed their eyes to the abject suffering of these magnificent animals in their state because, well, well, that's the law. And then finally, um, our really active case now, some of you may have heard, uh, involves Happy, an elephant at the Bronx Zoo in New York, who's been there for about 40 years and has been alone for about uh, 15 years. And we're just now waiting to hear if her case will be taken up by the highest court in New York, uh, the Court of Appeals. So uh, Robert already touched on this one, so I don't have to um, dwell on it too much. But you can see um, this is the 2014 decision, the Lavery case, the first time that Tommy's case was taken up on appeal. And this is where the judges are saying, Tommy, other chimpanzees, frankly, all non-human animals, all millions plus whatever species, they categorically cannot have rights because unlike human beings, uh, they have an incapability to bear any legal responsibilities. So for anyone who really wants to dig into this, I strongly encourage looking at the philosopher's brief because in also some of our legal filings, we put everything up on our website. If you really wanna geek out and uh, dig into it, which I encourage everyone to do, um, but it's just a disastrous thing. We're not aware of any other English speaking court or any court ever um, in history limiting the capacity for rights in this way. And Robert touched on some of the disasters. I noticed some of the questions, some of you folks are picking up very quickly, just how bad of a ruling this is. And I think when you talk about bias, why did why would judges say something like this? I think, I tend to think uh, we're biased, but that we've painted them into a corner that we've, like everything you've heard, we've presented this strong argument and they kind of have to wiggle out of it by saying things like this, basically making up new law. And that's really dangerous because we think that this could have ramifications elsewhere. But um, but again, looking over the you know some of the quotes I began with, it's hard not to conclude that when you're really trying to do something fundamentally to change the law in a really new way, you're going to face this kind of uh, pushback, at least initially, at least in some courts. You know, we don't expect you know we don't expect them to roll over right away for something um, really this different and new. So that's from our perspective, quite normal. Um, so then this is Hercules and Leo's case, which I mentioned in 2015, this was the first time a hearing was held and actually the, the, the folks keeping them captive and experimenting on them, there's a state university. So they were represented by the New York attorney general and it was this really big hearing, public hearing and aired a lot of different issues. And this is from the ruling that eventually came. So the judge was quite sympathetic um, but she felt she was bound by this ruling about duties and responsibilities. So sadly, she couldn't rule in Hercules and Leo's favor. But she also said um, something which I think is a fair point for debate, but also we you know, don't think is, is right. So this idea that um, it's, it's inappropriate, and we've heard this from in a lot of different ways, it's inappropriate to talk about 
you know, various human cases, to talk about slavery, to talk about the fact that women were property or children or Native Americans, you know, the list goes on. And, you know, that it's inappropriate to talk about those as a, as a predicate for rights for non-human animals. I have to say, I don't think that's right. You know, I think that um, you see, you can look back and see previous um, instances of people trying to expand human rights, facing the same pushback um, or similar pushback. And so I think that just because it makes judges uncomfortable doesn't mean that it's um, the wrong thing to do. Um, and this is kind of an outlier in that sense. But she also says something which I think is especially relevant here, that um, when we're talking about who gets to be a person, of course, how do they figure out, you know, a river or chimpanzee or an elephant, you know, should you be able to have a right? You know, it's a very serious, weighty determination to make. And so where do judges look to to make that kind of call? Well, we say they should look to our philosopher's brief and people like Lori, Dr. Marino. Um, but they say here that it won't be even focused on philosophy. That I think is, is just crazy talk because everything they do is philosophy, whether they are upfront about it or not, not just in our cases, but across the board. So there's this idea, and even we thought initially um, back in the day that let's try to keep our legal cases devoid of philosophy. You know, judges are not really trained in it. They're not there to be thinking about Aristotle or Peter Singer or anyone else. And we kind of went with that assumption, but then we started seeing, wait a minute, there's a real disconnect here. We need to, we need help. We need to bring in experts. And that's what an amicus brief is all about. So we've been very fortunate to have the philosophers be able to come in and, um, you know, weigh in on that and explain to the courts in a way that we can't really, we just can't do just how bad they're messing up the law, but also how, you know, they're really just, um, Kind of betraying their own principles in a lot of ways by continuing to hold the line that they have. So then we go where it gets sadly uh, really ugly, at least currently in Connecticut, the three traveling, the, the elephants in the traveling circus, two of whom were just worked to death over the last, you know, the pendency of our lawsuit. Uh, and of course, we don't, it's not like they call us up and tell us, oh, hey, hey your client died. You know, they, we have to find this out through public record requests or you know, it, they don't make anything easy, as you might imagine. And the courts there, sadly, didn't as well. So this is the Connecticut Superior Court, which is their trial court. And this was our first time filing a petition, a habeas petition on behalf of Beulah, Minnie and Karen in 2017. And the court came back and told us right after, I think it was the day after Christmas 2017. So it was a little, I, mean, I don't know if that was uh, on purpose, but uh, he said the petition is wholly frivolous on its face in legal terms, which... Um, it's not. Uh, we can talk about why that is, but, you know, I keep that in mind. You know, you have this court saying frivolous and I'll compare that to some of the other opinions in a moment. And then what really kind of was galling was that um, the, the court went on to say the petitioner in the present case, that would be us, the non-human rights project, naturally does not allege that it is apparent of any sort to the elephants. Yeah, go figure, we're not elephants and we didn't give birth to any elephants. So we didn't allege that we're parents to any elephants, which is not relevant to any of these questions. We're lawyers to the elephants and that's really what should matter. But then the court goes on to just rub salt in the wound to say, on the contrary, were the court to determine that the elephants are persons for habeas, it is the respondents, meaning the owners of this traveling zoo that work them to death, who are more akin to the parents of Beulah, Minnie, and Karen. So this is like, you know, these are people who will go in their backyard in Connecticut, in rural Connecticut, and charge you five bucks to take a ride on Beulah uh, for eight hours, 10 hours a day, and yet they're their parents. So, you know, this is the kind of, um, frankly, I'd say fairly absurd uh, reactions that we get. Um, and I think, and certainly speaking from the, um, the tone of the arguments that we've had, there is hostility among judges. They feel like you're wasting my time. This is, you know, you know what is this? Um, it's almost like it's a joke. And yet um, we don't stop because, you know, how we know that we're right and we have a lot on our side and we have the support of folks like Lori and Robert and many others. So um, this is just for us a, a bump in the road, which is a tragedy for Beulah, Minnie and Karen. But the fact is that none of the other existing laws out there are going to get them out. And that's why we have to do things like 
try to file habeas petitions and push judges to expand the law. And um, this is in that same year, um, and this was the second time we brought Tommy and Kiko's case. And again, you had an appeals court in Manhattan this time ruling that duties and responsibilities are prerequisite for rights. And then they doubled down on that. And, um, you know, they tried to deal with this, this, this issue of, well, what about humans who lack the ability for rights? Well, they say, well, they're members of the human community. So this is kind of meshing together two really faulty rationales for why our clients have to lose and why they have to remain um, in a cage and, you know, can't go to a sanctuary. Um, and so this is where we start to see some, you know, daylight really break through in terms of New York cases, but also I think the idea more broadly. And this was in 2018. Uh, the New York Court of Appeals is the highest court in New York. Judge Fahey is one of the seven, now currently six judges on that court. And um, he ruled in 2018 in a what's called a concurring opinion. It was just him. It wasn't the other members of the court. Um, and really, for the first time, we have a sitting high court judge who's essentially agreeing with everything that we're arguing, that the um, this is a question of precise moral and legal status, and that we have to look at the intrinsic nature, i.e., you know, the science of chimpanzees. So that includes, you know, affidavits from Jane Goodall and all of these other, you know, really leading chimpanzee experts, because that's part of every case that we do is, you know, tons of scientific information about who our clients are and why their freedom matters to them and why courts really ought to care about that. Mm -hmm. And um, he went on to say that the question of whether an animal has a right to liberty is profound and far reaching, uh, speaks to the relationship, our relationship with all the life around us and will not be able to ignore it. And at the end here, he seems to come around and say, you know, agree with us um, that a chimpanzee is a person, but really he's kind of even he, who's really so close, is still thinking about maybe there's some third category. Maybe we don't have to go so far as say a chimpanzee is a person for habeas. But again, you know, corporations, we live in a, a time when corporations have free speech rights under the Constitution and so many other things. So this idea that suddenly our notion of personhood is like treasured and it's about human community is um, ironic, to say the least, and I think is one more instance of judges just trying to sort of block us out. Um, and again, going back to Connecticut, I swear this is the last Connecticut thing. Um, this was pretty shocking too. The appellate court there said that there are profound implications for a court to conclude that an elephant or any non-human animal is entitled to assert a claim in a court of law as there is a lack of authority for recognizing a non-human animal as a person for purposes of habeas corpus, which would upend the state's legal system. So for us, that's you know really leaning into this idea of a slippery slope which is what our adversaries try to raise from time to time, that this idea that if you give rights to even a single elephant or a single species, that you're going to be, you know, setting in motion this unstoppable chain of events that, you know, makes it forces everyone to be a vegan or something, whatever they have in their mind. And so this, I think, is a prime example of judges who are otherwise very smart and capable people. When they're presented with a question like this, they something, something goes haywire, it, um, it seems. Um, but then finally, um, the most recent is Happy's case where we had three days of hearings. She was the second of our clients to get an actual hearing. Um, and that went on for three days and for 13 hours. And the judge heard us out and she ended up, you know, stating what she said here. Again, she was like the judge in Hercules and Leo's case bound. Um, but she noticed she didn't take issue at all with any of the um, arguments that we made or any of the sort of comparisons that we drew to human rights struggles. And rather she, you know, took in the science and she came back with this ruling that happy is indeed intelligent, autonomous. She should be treated with respect and dignity and may be entitled to liberty, which for us is saying the same thing as saying she may be a person for habeas corpus, which is again, the whole transformational goal of what we're doing here. Um, and so just finally, just to give folks a sense that it is actually at least in paper and like in the courts, easier to bring these kinds of cases or arguments. Uh, for example, in Pakistan last year, there may have some of you heard of the case of Kayvan, the elephant who has since been moved to a sanctuary in Cambodia. And with the help of Cher and others, um, you had the judge there say that 
Um, do animals have legal rights? Yeah, <laughs> without any hesitation in the affirmative. And then you have um, the case of Cecilia in Argentina, where um, she was a successful recipient of a habeas corpus writ and petition, very much similar to our cases. And uh, the judge said that, you know, what about not just Cecilia, but really broadening this issue out of uh, sentient beings who are subjects of rights. Subjects of rights is basically another way of saying a person um, and uh, who possess, among others, the fundamental right to be born, to live, to grow, and to die according to their species. So um, there's, you know, judges are kind of all over the map. It's not a surprise, you know, for 2,000 years, this has been the, the norm or more in a lot of ways, this idea that all animals can't have rights. Um, and so we think that given all that, um, we're doing okay, but, you know, we're still waiting for um, the first real breakthrough here in the U.S., but we're also working on cases um, in other countries as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, both of you, for th these uh, fascinating discussions. This is from uh, Laura, who says, um, it's very interesting. Could we say animals are, are so much wiser and cognitive since unlike ourselves, they instinctively know how to build homes and take care of their babies, et cetera. Whereas we have to rely upon external educational systems. Uh, and uh, they seem to have a far more natural uh, personhood. Uh, do you wanna, does anybody wanna take a look at um, or answer that? Or comment on that? I'm happy to say just a little bit. Um, <clears throat> first of all, the what one of the things that's I found interesting was when we got the philosophers together, the 17 of us, we we all had different notions of personhood. And in fact, a large part of our group just rejected the notion of personhood as being very troubled and fraught historically. There's been a, a lot of you know, ugly historical incidents involving personhood and the denial of personhood. If you read the history of the, um, the purpose of the notion of personhood, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so just to be clear, I mean, the strategy that, that the Non-Human Rights Project is using and the reason why the philosopher's brief was written is to say, look, if you're going to talk about personhood in the way that you people are talking about per personhood, meaning the, the courts and, you know, the legal and the culture, then you have an inconsistency. Now, whether or not as an animal rights advocate, as someone who, who does this, you know, for, for, my, for my life, whether I think personhood is the best way to go when we think about animals, no, it's, it's probably not the way. I mean, I don't think of it like that. And I think there's a lot to be said for the capabilities and the capacities and the kinds of um, sophisticated social bonds and the behaviors that animals exhibit that it, for me, it has nothing to do with personhood. It has to do with these other kinds of things, you know, maybe things mm -hmm. about autonomy, but these things are valuable separate from the concepts of personhood. So I, I think that Lara raises a good point that, um, you know, looking at animals through this lens of personhood seems to say, it's like humans stack the deck. It's like, here's what you got to do to be a person. And oops, it just so happens that only, only humans are persons. So it's a very troubling and troubled and fraught concept. But if the courts want to play that game, then I think we're willing to say, if that's the game, then let's play the game. Yeah. Kevin, you have anything to say about that? Oh, God, there could be so much to say about that. We might... <laughs> We might be here till tomorrow. Okay, well, let's let's then see if we can get some more questions. This is a really interesting question from Madeline. And she says, could it be argued? Now, this is going back to what Robert said about uh, community and, and rights and responsibilities and engagement in a human society. She says, could it be argued that chimpanzees previously used in entertainment or biomedical research have already contributed to human society in a sense. That would be true for cetaceans and elephants who are also used for entertainment. Anyone? 
I think it's definitely, it's like, I often think you have moral personhood and then legal personhood. And if you're talking about morality, like it should be like no debate. I think that's most largely accepted, at least in, you know, theory on paper that we do owe these beings something because of all that we've taken from them. But, um, but again, you know, all the laws and all the kind of fluffy, nice statements can still leave an individual like Tommy or Kiko, Hercules and Leo really out in the cold. So mm -hmm. it really does necessitate this um, pushing ahead of trying to, um, you know, like Robert said, we don't think that personhood is this great kind of unassailable idea, but it's what we have. And we think that we have to, um, even if it's like fit, fitting a round peg in a square hole, sometimes you have to kind of force it because at the end of the day, the law is, it's not all about rationality and personhood is one of those areas where it's really not. It's about so many other things deeper than that and intuitive and it's, it's hard to really pin down, but it, nonetheless, we think um, there's a ton of value in getting judges to, you know, forcing them to, to talk about it and confront it in a, in a head-on way. And if I could just interject for a moment. Sure. No, the, the whole history, I mean, look, the fact that legally speaking, there are only two categories of entities, persons and things, that kind of dualism is so radically out of touch with just common sense. Forget about philosophy. It's just common sense. How could you think that there are persons and then things like dogs are the same things as chairs, right? Legally. So, so just that, that notion that um, we have these beings and they're in this category. But if you look throughout the history, particularly in Western philosophy, you look at things like Immanuel Kant saying, um, you know, persons are these rational beings and they have this, this ability and everything else is a thing. You know, this is ingrained going back to Descartes and as you, as you mentioned, Lori Aristotle. So these are deeply ingrained notions in our culture. But the, the, the thing that's weird is the average, if you take a three-year-old kid, they know that a dog is not the same thing as a chair. So these, these, these dichotomies are so, they're so artificial to begin with. I think it's important to give it some context and go, okay, like I said, we're going to go into the court where they have this belief system, but we all agree just the very foundation of it is just way off to begin with. So, yeah. And I think, I think that the really fascinating part to me is how human psychology and our cognition actually impacts our law, um, the, the, the things that we do in society that, um, you know, really, really just reflect our own biases, our own, our own inherent um, views about things. And, you know, like you said, the Scalina Torah, it's still with us today, you know, um, it may not have anything to do with, with science in terms of the way evolution and natural selection works or what it looks like, but it's embedded in our brains. And so um, that's something that has to be overcome, uh, not only in the legal system, but just in an everyday sense and how we treat other animals. So yeah, that's great. Here's, here's one, it's from Elizabeth. Around the world and here in the US, certain groups of people are still deprived of human rights. And so shouldn't we be focusing on their personhood before investing resources to fight for personhood for non-humans? Well, all human beings are persons. And you know, rights are not like pie. We often have to remind people that giving some attention to non-humans is not depriving necessarily humans. Um, I think that it's an understandable and a reaction we get a lot, but I think that again, you can look to even contemporary human rights struggles and there's always this sort of justification of, well, these people are suffering worse or this one's suffering worse, so go pay attention to that. Um, so frankly, um, yeah, no. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess what I would say is, I, I don't, look, I, you know, having done this for a number of years, I've heard, uh, people object and say, oh, here's one thing that's not uncommon among people who do animal rights is that you people care more about animals than humans, you know? And I'm not saying that that's what the question questioner is saying, but there's a, there's a kind of, there's a kind of um, 
there's a way that people see animal rights people as misanthropic in some way or something. And what I want to say is, look, I, I, I think all of us are on board with human social justice issues and, you know, feminism and anti-racism, right? So I just don't see um, the fact that there are humans who are suffering. Um, if I, if I do some kind of calculus, I'm like, wait, I got to make sure all the humans are okay first. And then I'll talk about the animals. To me, that's, to be honest with you, that's, I think that's a kind of speciesism. And I feel like suffering is suffering wherever it's found. Not to say that, you know, the suffering of an ant is the same as the suffering of an enslaved, you know, person, human. But what I'm saying is, I don't think that there's anything inconsistent with having, I mean, focusing your attention on various kinds of, of, of campaigns, you know? I, mean, exactly. I, I think they're all, it's all consistent. Um, there's an interesting question I uh, hear about whether any of these rulings, uh, personhood, legal personhood can harm humans in any way. What do you think about that? Well, certainly in theory, you know, you look at it, just the plain text of it, the, the starting with the one about social duties and responsibilities, so the court just puts a footnote in there and says basically, well, this doesn't apply to humans because generally speaking, humans have the unique capacity to take on legal duties. So they try to like carve out, you know, this neat, you know, niche for even humans who don't meet their own contrived, basically made up mm -hmm. uh, standard of duties and responsibilities. But still, we argue, yes, absolutely. Um, and I think that just speaks to we like to think the inherent justice of what we're arguing about. The fact that if you deny us, you're really hurting yourself almost is biblical. It's almost like, yeah, you get what you, you reap what you sow. And I think that even more in the human rights context, these issues are becoming inseparable. Like mm -hmm. some of the most pressing issues involve the degradation of land, which inherently involves the deprivation of the rights of various non-human animals or what should be their rights. So to say that there's like any way to separate these out is um, in our day and age, I think just, just not not accurate and i think you know in in in, ter in terms of harm i think what a lot of people think of is it's not really harm but inconvenience so it, it will be inconvenient for dolphins or elephants or chimpanzees to be considered legal persons and we will not be able to do some of the things that we currently do to them that's not a harm, that's an inconvenience. Um, and it's a change, it's a change in social mores. Um, so a lot of times where humans think of harm, they, they are actually talking about um, a, an inconvenience to them, I think, anyway. Um, there is a really interesting question here from Amanda, who says, can you discuss the use of the pronoun it to refer to animals? Um, because obviously the connotation is that an it is a thing. Um, and what do you think? I know that there is a, a, a whole, um, as the use of pronouns is gaining more and more attention now uh, among humans, right? Um, do you think that this is important in terms of how we see non-human beings? Well, Lori, I think I, I'd like to hear I mean, I'm, I want to hear what Kevin has to say too, but I know that this is one of your specialties in speaking about who versus it. So um, if you want to say something and, and Kevin as well. Well, I mean, I, I always refer to other animals as who, and, and I think it's critically important um, because it, it language not only reflects our thinking, but it shapes our thinking. And in especially when you do know whether it's a, a male or a female, um, uh, you should use uh, the proper pronoun. They are not it's. Um, so I, I think it's very, very important and I fully support the, the move now to, um, to refer to other animals as um, him or her and, and not as it. Yeah, I've, we've always done that. We make a very strong point to, I think we just sent, there was just a letter that went out to the AP, trying to get the AP style guide adjusted so that, you know, this becomes a norm. 
So that's pretty interesting. I think sometimes people think, well, isn't that basically what you're doing? Like with the person thing, you're just trying to slot in a new definition. No, it's a much more complicated. Well, both are complicated. I don't mean to say that one's more complicated than the other, but there's like a little more magic, we think, to having a non-human animal cross that threshold than, you know, just having the other things very important too, like Lori said, because all of this stuff actually helps lay the groundwork for judges to actually think the way that we think and, you know, agree with us. Yeah, exactly, exactly. There's another question here from Camille. Outside of these fabulous philosophical and legal arguments, will there be other ways to turn the tide on judges' decisions and biases? Um, for example, the more cases pre presented, the more they'll start to take this more seriously, or perhaps cultural norms sh will shift. That's a, a $6 million question. In other words, at what point are we going to tip that boulder over the hill and, and have a judge say, yeah, this is a, this is a legal person who has the capacity for at least some fundamental rights like bodily liberty and bodily integrity. That's, I don't know if we, there's a quest answer to that because it is, it is, is sort of a, the question of, uh, I mean, I think I, one thing I would say in reference to that is that, um, you know, besides the Non-Human Rights Project, there are many other um, efforts going on to have the, the rights of other animals recognized. So it's not like, you know, if, if they don't get to be legal persons, you know, that's it. Um, there are many different ways to uh, get at this issue. It's a heavy lift. It's a big lift. But um, I think, you know, there are a lot of different uh, approaches. And, uh, you know, I think uh, personally, the once, uh, once a judge does see that uh, a dolphin or an elephant or a chimpanzee is a legal person, that is really going to, to make it easier um, once one judge makes that leap. This is from Jennifer who says, shouldn't more classification of sentient beings be pursued due to the rise of artificial intelligence? Um, she says, I feel that would be a good angle for an argument, a way to protect and classify human beings who possess uh, certain cognitive abilities. Hmm. That's an interesting one. Anyone want to venture a just you know an answer to that? Well, I think it comes down to like kind of the moral person versus a legal person. Um, I think personally that sentience, yeah, that's that's plenty for me. Like in terms, of you should if you can feel pain and respond and seek pleasure, that should be enough to course have certain corresponding rights that protect those interests. So, but that's very different than going into a courtroom and actually getting a judge to agree with you. Because like I said, even when we're arguing very carefully only about an elephant and only talking about their species, the judges are constantly being pulled into this direction of saying, well, if you do this, it's chickens next or it's pigs next. It's slippery slope. And yeah. When in this day and age, I mean, you just, that's just, um, it becomes at that point, you th I think you're putting too much of a, of a roadblock in front of the judge. So we are very clear that, you know, autonomy, all this science, all this talk, it's it's sufficient, but not necessary. So in other words, there could be, and will be other ways of pursuing this kind of work. It just so happens that we think that autonomy, since this has never been done before, we think that we need to come with compelling, the most compelling scientific evidence we can, which we think right now is in these species, chimpanzees, elephants, and cetaceans primarily, but also because this idea of autonomy is something that judges have cared about or written about or ruled on for many hundreds of years. And so we're not kind of asking them to invent a new wheel. We're just sort of modifying the one that they have, which again, I can see that's, that seems very incremental, but the fact is we think that when you're, you're making a small change, but in a very deep way that it uh, can have you know, kind of bigger ramifications. And I think that's why we've seen, 
you know, we're not asking judges to do something easy. So it's maybe not so surprising that they've been um, said some of the things that they have. And if I may, um, and Kevin, you probably know better than I, I'm pretty sure that there is a third category in some European countries. France, I believe, has sentient being. Um, and mm -hmm. I, from what I read, the upshot is that there's not really a major substantial shift in, in policies and treatment. So, um, and one of the other things that we speak about in the book, actually, we address the issue of sentient being as a third category is, one of the worries is that, well, first of all, just to be clear, the argument is that autonomy is sufficient for personhood, right? We're, no one's arguing that autonomy is a necessary condition, right? So, so no one's saying you have to be this advanced autonomous kind of being to be a person. We're just saying if you are like Tommy and Kiko, then you're a person. One of the fears though, when in, in this third category is that um, we, we were afraid that in the future, if sentient, sentient being became a third category, there's fear from the disability rights community that says, oh, wait a second. Now we see the writing on the wall is a, dis a disabled child will be lowered, if you will, into this category and they're not really a full person, right? So there, you have to be careful with, you, you know, the, the law of unintended consequences. You have to think, you know, this is going to open up this, this whole uh, expand this uh, sort of liberation of animals, but then if history is any indication, humans tend to find ways to oppress other humans, given any category they can do it. So it's a, it's a complicated issue. And this is from um, Heather. She asks, how does this work make you feel? Well, um, <laughs> inspired, but also challenged and sometimes, you know, um, eh, not discouraged, but you know, it can be like a little tough to get these kind of rulings. Um, but then you just remind yourself while you're doing it, but also get outside of the whole legal profession and think more broadly and see that actually uh, more and more people are coming around and we're starting to look almost like we look conservative now. <laughs> like people are like, why are you only doing this? Like you should be doing, uh, blow it up. So that I think is actually a good thing. Um, so cause for hope from, from my perspective. Yep. Robert? Um, I could say that as an academic, I mean, I, basically I'm a philosophy professor. So very few things, it, it, when I wear my philosophy professor hat, other than say, sort of affecting students and hopefully in the best of ways, you know, affecting students' lives and educations. Other than that, I usually feel like most of what I'm doing, it's no one's reading what I write, no one cares. It's like, it's this kind of like intellectual exercise. And then to have an opportunity as an animal rights philosopher to join with the other animal rights scholars, many of whom are very prominent. And it was it's quite an honor, as I said, um, to actually do something that had an effect a, even a tiny effect on the world for me, that made me feel like, wow, all this stuff I do in my head and in my office, it actually, um, it actually for once kind of translated to something in the world. So I, as much as a cynic as I am about about the future of you know animals being liberated, I do feel like these these are the kinds of moments where I feel like Kevin said I feel optimistic. And even going back to a point, uh, Lori, that you addressed earlier is like. How do we get judges? I have a feeling in my most optimistic moments that the world is slowly changing. I'm not saying that animals aren't suffering. There are, you know, 100 billion animals a year. It's, it's terrible. But, but if you were to say 20 years ago, I mean, even if I said 20 years ago, if I went to a restaurant and I said, is this vegan? People would go, what? So the fact <laughs> that there's, a, there's a, a little shift in consciousness, mm -hmm. it gives me some optimism, not in my lifetime, but maybe down the road people will be thinking, wow, what we're doing to animals is, is horrible. And so um, those are my optimistic moments. So if I can help contribute to that in some little way, if I can leave the planet a little bit better than you know, how it was when I got here, I'll, I'll, I'll feel happy. Well, I, I have to say that both of you are doing quite a lot. And, and it is such an honor to, to know you, both of you. Um, and to collaborate with you and to work with you and 
And I would say, you know, I think I can speak for all of us. Whenever we see a, a, an orca in a tank or a, an elephant in a circus or a chimpanzee in a cage, it's clear we have to do something. It's not a question of, well, you know, it's what can I do, not should I do something. So um, I think we're all driven by that same desire. Well, I want to end things by thanking everyone here for hanging in with us and um, for uh, your great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but you can always find us um, on internet or social media. And again, uh, I want to thank Kevin for phenomenal work, phenomenal life's work, as well as Robert. And uh, we'll see you. We'll see you again. Stay well, everyone.